Welcome to the Master Your Millions podcast, the show all about your financial potential and leaving a legacy for future generations. Here are your hosts, Jason and Scott Henderson. Welcome back, everyone. I'm your host, Scott Henderson, and my co-host is Dr. J. We are experienced investors with a huge advantage of over 100 years of wisdom and knowledge and experience in investing. Here today on Master Your Millions, we have a very, very exciting guest. I know a lot of you have asked us questions about, about this, this man's brother, his father, and some of the incredible things that they've been doing. But Jason, tell us a little bit about who we have coming on. Well, you let the cat a little bit out of the bag. Today we have Ethan Woolwind. He is a 13-year-old that comes from Ohio. His father is Eric and mother's Lila. Uh, our listeners will probably remember Eric Woolwind. However, many more will probably remember Devin. He was our 15-year-old phenom that we interviewed a while back. Well, guess what? Eric is a 13-year-old phenom. And yeah, doing every a little better. Yeah, he seems like uh, 2.0, doing better than the first one, cruising along. We talked to him earlier, and it sounds like, well, Ethan, I mean, yeah, Ethan, thanks for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me here. We're very excited, and I understand this this will be your first, first podcast interview. Yes, and for some reason, I decided it would be the perfect day two days ago to get sick, so sorry if I sound weird. Or if I don't sound good. No, that's great. So let's talk a little bit about your journey. We're totally impressed that as of two days ago, you have how many units? 28. 28. And two days ago, you must have closed on some. How many did you close on? Uh, I bought one two days ago from an auditor's auction. And was that a single family or what was that? Uh, it was a single family. And how did you go about getting that one? Give me a second. So every every year, our family gets a list of the forfeited properties from the auditor's auction. And we decide if anyone in our family wants to buy one of them. My dad gave me and my, my brother the list, and he gave us first pick. Devin said he didn't want to buy any, so I got my pick of the 31 properties, and I decided I only wanted to buy one house off the list, since auditor auction properties tend to have a lot of work. So I narrowed down the list to find the best one. I removed the properties that were in a bad city, had too much work, according to Google Maps photos, because we look on Google Maps, because we don't want to waste time driving over there if... It's obvious that we wouldn't want to buy them. And I also removed the vacant land. After I narrowed, I ended up narrowing the list down to two properties that I wanted to look at. And then I gave my notes to my dad and he ended up finding two that he wanted to buy or wanted to look at. And when I went to my grandparents, I had my grandpa drive me to the house close to where he lived and he sat in the truck while I went in, since I found the house was open and vacant. And I FaceTimed my mentor and asked him a couple questions about repairs and pricing and to make sure that it wouldn't cost too much to repair. And I filled our I filled out our entire repair checklist and I wrote the amounts that my mentor told me it would cost to fix stuff. And the total repair cost was just under $18,000. And I found the comps were really low, but I didn't care how much it would sell for because I was just buying it for the cash flow. And I came up with the max bid for the house. I got that by multiplying the rent. I took the rent, multiplied it by 50. And the formula we use is if you do that, if the total purchase price and repair the repairs and purchase price, if that is the same or below the rent times 50, then it's a great deal. And the so rent... Is that a month? That must be a yearly rent then or a monthly? Monthly, monthly rent. Okay. It, since I live in Ohio, it's easier to find properties like that. 
but I haven't pro found properties anywhere else that I found a deal that good. But for where I live, then that's the deal I try to go for. And if it's in a good neighborhood where I wouldn't have to pay as much for a for tenant damages, I would pay up to 65 times the rent in my area. And the rent multiplied by 50 for this house was 37500 minus about 17500 in repairs. That's $20,000. But my dad told me not to stop at a round number like that because most people have a mental block. So I came up with a max bid of 20250 I then went to the auction and ended up getting it for $18,500, which made this an amazing deal. The house still needs repairs, and it's all up to me to make sure that they get done. And I've learned since the last house I bought to follow up on your contractors to make sure the repairs get done in a timely manner. Speaking of which, would you like to hear about the biggest mistake I've made? Yes, would love to. One of my biggest mistakes was one of the properties I bought had a list of repairs that needed done. And my dad told me that I was completely in charge of this rehab. It was the first rehab that it was the first rehab that it was all up to me. He didn't help me with this. He said if I had a question, then I could ask him, but he wouldn't volunteer any information. And since the house was only about a mile away from my grandmother's house, it would be easy for her to drive me over there to check on it every week. And it would only take me 10 to 15 minutes to look at it every week. But I didn't. And... Excuse me. But I didn't. And it wasn't until I saw that it had been vacant for nine months that was painful. Uh, because I wasn't paying attention and there was still quite a bit of work to get done. I immediately called my dad to ask, what contractors should I call to get these repairs done? And then I used the notes that I had from going over there the couple of times to tell the contractors exactly what needed done and made sure that it got done by checking on it each week. And although it cost me nine months of rent, I learned a valuable lesson, which is to check up on your contractors. And after it gets rented, to manage your manager. And as a former president once said, trust, but verify. Very good. So tell me, uh, Ethan, you, you mentioned earlier that you called your mentor. Who is that? My dad. Okay. <laughs> that's what probably we all assumed. And that's really cool that you do. He gives to... me most of the information that I need to do stuff, but he doesn't volunteer information. But if I have a question, I can ask him and he'll answer it. And is that calling him mentor, is that something that you have come up or is that something he wants you to do to help you understand the relationship? Uh, it's something that he came up with. Cool. So let's go back in time a little bit. Uh, we want to get to your book here in a minute uh, and talk about that. But I want to go back in time. What got you in the idea or in the mode of investing? Uh, well, I was not taught to go to school, get good grades, get a job. And my grandparents have been retired for as long as I can remember. And my parents had been investing since before I was born. And I started, I started because my parents had been taking me to real estate meetings and listening to podcasts basically since I was born. Uh, buying real estate seemed normal to me. So I was already learning about real estate, and I had heard that by investing in real estate, then it, me it meant when I moved out, I could do whatever I wanted, and I wouldn't have to work at a job. But And that sounded great to me. But now that I've been investing for a couple of years, I know it's not that easy. You need to actually manage your properties, or if you have a property manager, you need to manage your manager. And since everyone else in my family was investing, I decided I would as well. When did you purchase your first house? My first house, uh, I bought when I was seven. Tell us about first. that one. 
my first deal, I guess. Uh, well, when I started, my first problem was I was underage. And the best way to get around that is to start a company. No one asks the birth date of a company. And starting an LLC had two main benefits. One, it's good for asset protection. And two, someone over the age of 18 that owns part of a company can sign stuff. My dad also told me that we should start the company with $1,000 to buy something small. I then bought a mobile home with the $1,000 because that's the price of was the price in Ohio. I bet people in California are wondering, how could you buy something with $1,000? <laughs> but around here, I could get a mobile home with the $1,000. And then I cleaned it up and sold it for $2,000. This was completely normal to me. I bet everyone here has heard the term buy low and sell high. I had heard that so many times at seminars and events, it had become second nature. And after that, I looked for a house to buy, and a contractor that worked for my dad told him that he just wanted out of a six unit. When my dad told me this, I thought it might be cool to buy a six unit for my next property instead of a house. So I did my due diligence, and I figured out that he was behind on payments. That's when I saw my opportunity. And since I just sold my mobile home, I had some money to buy it. But I thought that the $1,000 would not be enough. But I really wanted it. So I figured out who he owed money to. The first mortgage was held by my homeschool evaluator and friend from a RIA group. The second mortgage was from a lady I had never met, which kind of scared me to ask her to take over a mortgage because she didn't know me and I was seven. So I started by talking to my homeschool evaluator, and she said if I paid the missed payments right now, she would let me take over. She would let me take over the mortgage as written. Luckily, the $2,000 would cover the past due payments, and I said if I could get an agreement on the second mortgage, I would pay it, or I would buy it, and I would pay her that week. Now, all I have to do is talk to a lender I had never met and convince her to let me take over the mortgage. So I asked my dad to call her because I was scared she wouldn't take a seven-year-old seriously. <laughs> and he told her that his son wanted to buy the property and would take over the mortgage, the mortgage payments. I think he forgot to mention that I was seven uh, but she agreed, she agreed to meet us and invited us to her home. My dad always told me that people do business with people they know, like, and trust. So I decided she should get to know, like, and trust me. We talked for a little bit at her kitchen table, and I realized she knew my grandpa. He was a dentist in a very small town, and she was the fiscal officer for the same town. And I was really lucky that everyone in that town knew everyone else. And she liked and my, respected my grandpa. My grandpa wasn't even in real estate. He was just a friend of hers. But when she saw my last name, she knew I would be better to take over the loan than the adult that wasn't paying her. When I asked how much was still owed and how far behind he was, she said she had never gotten a payment from him. She didn't care about late fees or interest. She just wanted her money back. And I told her I didn't have the $25,000 to pay her, but I would make a payment on the first of next month. She said she would let me take over the mortgage, but she wanted, she wanted paid back in two years. But she would lower the interest rate from 10% to 5%. I looked at my amortization table and let her know that the building couldn't possibly make enough to pay her back in two years. But if she lowered the interest rate to 5%, like she offered, then I would pay her back in seven years and she would get her first payment in about two weeks. She agreed, which made me feel great that my second deal was not a house, but a six unit, and also the feeling that I, negoti I negotiated it to where I bought a six unit for $2,000 as a seven-year-old. 
Awesome. And when we got in my dad's truck, he told me the deal isn't done until the paperwork's done. That's when I realized my dad was going to make me learn how to do all the paperwork I needed for this deal. And I thought, seriously, I had to talk to someone I didn't know, and now I have to do paperwork? <laughs> he told me everything we needed to do and explained when working with a private lender, we need to make their life as easy as possible. He did most of it for this deal, but I still had to remember all the details from the of the negotiation. It seemed overwhelming then. But now I can write a purchase agreement, mortgage, deed, and promissory note on my own. The best part is, next year, her mortgage will be paid off, and I'll be making almost $400 a month more. Love it. That's fun. That's absolutely incredible. I know a lot of people just have a hard time believing that, you, one, you can buy real estate that cheap, <laughs> and two... <laughs> that someone as young as you can do it. But that's what's so inspiring about all of this is it can be done. Whether you're brand new, whether you're experienced, there's everyone can win and you just have to learn how. So tell us a little bit, like you had your first deal, then you had these six units, you had to manage the contractors and things. Um, what happened there? Did they just not do their work and they were just sitting aside because you were seven and didn't, thought they could pull one over on you or how what happened the house that took nine months to rent that wasn't the six unit that was a house later uh but i didn't check up on him and i i gave all the information to the management company and they they don't do big rehabs and they didn't tell me that they weren't i didn't i didn't call any of the contractors or I didn't go to look at it to make sure anything got done. And I don't know if the information just didn't get to the contractors or what, but I know that now I'll go over there every week to make sure it gets done. <laughs> Cause losing nine months of rent is painful. Not that right. So one of the things we teach about here on Master Your Millions is that it's important to have a team. And you've brought up a very interesting point here, what we really haven't covered before with our listeners, and that is that even though you have a team, someone needs to be leader and someone needs to be the quarterback or the head football coach or whatever you want to say and really follow through. Right. And like you said, the president trust, but verify. Yes, you need to be following through with that. And and most of the time uh, there isn't going to be a problem. However, that one time that you don't follow up is usually when there is something. And it can be very financially painful and also emotionally painful. So, man, I, I thought of that. I should have. It was so close to grandma and grandpa's house. I should have gone over there. It would have been so easy. How do they only do that? And I'm certain that you'll never make that mistake again. Of I hope so. the is the six unit, is that your best deal so far? Would you say that? Or is there something that's been better than that? That's my favorite deal, and it it does make a lot of money. But I'd say my best deal, or when you say best, you mean like my biggest deal? Um uh, no, not necessarily. What is your biggest deal? Tell us about your biggest deal. My biggest deal is when I bought 20% of a 60 unit for only $20. It's the same deal my brother talked about because we both bought 20% of it. Uh, and the only thing is it costed all of my depreciation for 10 years and then half of my depreciation for another five years. But being that I was a couple years younger than my brother and made less money from my job and my rentals, it was an even better deal for me. How we came up with this deal is we figured out what the seller wanted. Then, with a lot of help from my mentor, accountant, and lawyer, we figured out how to give it to him. And finally, we all made more money and had less hassle. Another really important lesson is if you don't know exactly how to is you don't need to know exactly how to do all of these. You just need to have an open mind and know who to ask. Or, as my brother would say, be creative and take action. Would you like to hear a couple more details, or did you already hear this story? 
No, we. I don't think we actually ta- told us about this story. So go ahead. You'll be the first one for our listeners to, to hear it from. Yeah, we want to hear how you bested your brother. <laughs> yes, we want you to one up on him. <laughs> I'd always been taught to to get what you want in a negotiation. You need to figure out what the other person wants first. So we kept asking the seller what he wanted. It didn't happen all in one conversation. It took about two weeks to figure out to figure out what all the partners wanted in this deal. Uh, then it took another couple of days for the accountant to figure out how we could do it. And finally, with the section of the IRS code highlighted and emailed to us, we gave that information from the accountant and details from the deal to the lawyer, and we asked him, asked him to put it on paper and make it legal for us. A week or two after that, my brother and I met the seller at the bank, and he had the sales paperwork notarized, and then got a picture of all three of us while he was cashing his checks. What we found out was that the owner only bought his part of the 60 unit for the depreciation. So we asked him if he would sell us 40% of the building for $40, split between me and my brother, uh, if we gave him all of our depreciation for 10 years and then half of our depreciation for another five years. And he kept 10% of the upside and he wouldn't make a capital call. He was retiring and didn't want to put money in the company after he retired. When we asked him, he agreed because he expected to save $125,000 in taxes, which was more than his half of the equity that he had in the building at the time. He saves over $10,000 a year at tax time because of that. And I wasn't making that much money at the time, so it only cost me a couple hundred a year at tax time. Wow, that's amazing. Good good thinking. So you own 20% of a 60 unit which is obviously cash flowing and doing good for you. Hopefully. I I don't know for sure. I'd have to look it up, but I, so I would you, guess so. Yeah, you rely a lot on a, on your accountant to be doing a lot of that then. Uh, my accountant and uh, management company. I love it. So you really do have a team. It was like we were saying earlier of how you don't need to know how to do everything, but find the right people. Yeah, it. Uh, if you're like my dad, or if you get if if you have three hundred properties, it gets really hard to go and fix them all up by yourself and manage them all by yourself, and it's just not, especially to teach kids like us. It's very hard to get us interested if we all we see is them driving to properties to collect rent or driving there in the middle of the night to fix something. So he has to hire people for that. Uh, and that's what allows him to get so many deals and get them done. Especially, I couldn't do it by myself. I don't know how to do uh, drywall or plumbing. I I know some of it, but I couldn't do it all of it by myself. So, so in order to and I have to hire people for that, right. To get, in order to get bigger. To Can you say that again? In order to get bigger and do more and more deals, you need to have a team and people doing their, their thing instead of you attempting to do it all yourself. Mm-hmm. And my dad yeah. likes to say, whenever someone asks, how do you do this? Then sometimes he'll say, we have people for that. Or in other words, we have a team for that. That's awesome. So tell me, tell me five years down the line. Where are you? What what's happened in the last five years? And what is what does life look like? What are you working towards? A lot of speaking and traveling and promoting books. <laughs> As we read you know, we recently published our books, uh, everyone in our family. I published The Treehouse, my brother published The Garage, and my parents published Family Success Triangle. Uh, I don't know if they can see this, but here's a couple of them. 
uh, available on Amazon, and we're trying to promote all of these, and as we're trying to promote all of them, so we're tra whenever we travel to events, we promote them, and it they came out a month ago, a month or two months ago, and we're trying to promote and sell as many as we can. And so I've read most of the treehouse. I haven't read all of it. I would I was attempting to get all the way done before this this interview and it's it's pretty good and i recommend people read it in fact we will put a link to a, an amazon page where you can purchase it it's just one click to that the tree house by ethan Woolwind, and we encourage people to purchase that and learn the wisdom of what he's sharing from his perspective the cool thing is is it's written in a way that it's very easy to read it's kind of in a story form and yet it has um, real good nuggets of of wisdom that's applicable to what we're to all talking about here on this podcast. It's it's really good. We recommend that. So, Eric, uh, Ethan, do you have any parting words, wisdom? How would you like to end this up? Uh, well, a lot of people ask me why I wrote my book. Uh, funny story. I actually never wanted to write a book in the first place. I'd watched my brother write a book, and it took him almost a year. And when he was done, he just gave it out like a business card. So I thought if I wrote wrote one, then I would have been giving it. I would have given it out like a business card. I already had a business card. Why would I spend a year of my life making something I already had? It wasn't until uh, late twenty twenty one when he gave one of his books to a speaker at the National Real Estate Convention. And he was so impressed that my brother wrote this book uh, that he invited him to a conference on the other side of the country. And I had to stay home. <laughs> then I thought maybe it was more than just a 100-page business card. Then in January 2022... I met Mark Victor Hansen, the author of Chick the Chicken Soup for the Soul series. And <clears throat> excuse me. And he told me if I wrote a book, then he would publish it. And one thing to note about Mark is that he's such a nice and uplifting person that if you talk to him for even five minutes, then you think, I gotta go out and do something good for this world. So it probably would have been harder to say no to Mark than to actually go out and write the book. So here I am with the book. Yes, and we recommend people read it, just like Jason said, because there is wisdom coming from someone who is 12. Is that right, Ethan? 13. 13. 13. Coming from 13 because you have to hire, hire things out. He's naturally has to be trained in the way that you need to look at the world in order to expand and become bigger. But that's wonderful. Way to go, Ethan. We, we're excited. We Keep us in mind. We want to buy the next one when you decide to publish that as well. All right? Yeah, Thank and when you. Scott was saying a minute ago about where are you going to be in five years, I'm, I'm hoping you'll still remember us, is that we were your first podcast interview, and you'll come back on our show You know when you're – very well known and have all these properties six inches taller you'll come we'll back. just put it that way yeah <laughs> six inches taller <laughs> at this rate that'll mean next year probably well right <laughs> cool jason any closing words no once again ethan we are so pleased we, we are honored to have had you on the podcast you've been a great addition to uh our growing library of interviews with people we wish you the all the luck in the world. May God be with you and things go well with you and hope that you know, you're know you successful. And the next time we talk to you, that you can tell, tell us about your biggest deal is not the one we've already talked about. Amen to that. Well, thanks everyone for tuning in with us. If you'd like to connect with us or with Ethan, just check out the show notes down below. Remember, you can hit us up on our Facebook group, Instagram, Twitter, or shoot us an email. All the links are just down below. Also, 
don't forget, if you like the show, make sure to hit the subscribe button and drop us a review. It really helps us out, and we'd very much be grateful for that. And remember, mastering your millions all starts with your mind and your team. Make sure they are the best. Catch you next time. Thanks for listening to Master Your Millions with Jason and Scott Henderson. Check the show notes for any links or contact information about today's guest. Make sure to follow the show so you don't miss any future episodes.